runner to bring uh, folks a microphone so everyone can hear your question. And I will ask and will repeat that when you do have the microphone that you state uh, who you are and where you are from first. Um, really, really happy to see the number of students, faculty, and staff, uh, cabinet members, uh, fellow laureates uh, that are here today. Uh, and we look forward to being able to raise a glass uh, afterwards together. Uh, this week has been about recognizing not only excellence in world-changing research, but careers and lives dedicated to service and impact. This week has also told a powerful story of immigration with Dr. Suki Manabe and now Professor McMillan. And I just want to say as a first-generation American, this has resonated powerfully with me this week. And now I am pleased to hand the microphone over to the Provost of Princeton, Debbie Prentice. Thank you, Ben. It's a pleasure, truly a pleasure, uh, to welcome all of you to this press conference and celebration. Uh, my name, as Ben said, is Debbie Prentice, uh, and I'm the provost of Princeton University. Uh, this is a very special occasion uh, for Professor McMillan, for his family, um, and as Ben said, for his countries. Uh, Professor McMillan is a dual citizen of the U.S. and the U.K., so both the Americans and the Scots get to cheer as one today. Um, this is also a, a very important uh, moment for, for the broader us, for, for so many of us um, on the Princeton campus, uh, the staff, the faculty, um, and the students uh, who are honored and proud uh, to call Dave a colleague, a partner, and a teacher. Uh, so Princeton's president, Chris Eisgruber, is unfortunately on the West Coast to attend a memorial service, and he regrets deeply, deeply uh, that he is unable to join us in person. Um, but he wanted to share uh, this message. David McMillan is a brilliant chemist whose transformative insights and accomplishments have enhanced the power of organic chemistry to benefit human health and address other practical problems. He is also a faculty leader who, during his time at Princeton, has worked with colleagues to build this university's Department of Chemistry into one of the world's best. All of us at Princeton are thrilled to celebrate this well-deserved honor. So that's from President Eisgruber. Uh, this is the first Nobel in Chemistry awarded to a Princeton faculty member. We've had alums receive it, but not faculty. Um, and it's a landmark moment uh, for a superb department. Uh, I know many of its members, I see right here, um, are here with us in the audience to celebrate Dave's award. Um, so let me uh, take a moment, uh, for those of you who don't know Dave, to, to uh, share a few key details um, from his storied career. Uh, David McMillan was born in Belshill, Scotland in 1968 and received his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Glasgow in 1989 and his PhD from the University of California, Irvine in 1996. He did postdoctoral work at Harvard University and then joined the chemistry faculty at the University of California, Berkeley in 1998. He joined the Department of Chemistry at Caltech in 2000. In 2006, he came to Princeton University and was appointed as director of the university's Merck Center for Catalysis. Catalysis is a word you're going to hear a lot. Um, he's been the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor of Chemistry since 2011, and he served as chair of the chemistry department from 2010 to 2015. So as the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences highlighted in, uh, today in announcing the award, Building molecules is a difficult art. Benjamin List and David McMillan are awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2021 for their development of a precise new tool for molecular construction, organocatalysis. This has had a great impact on pharmaceutical research and has made chemistry greener. Professor McMillan is an innovator pursuing radically new concepts in catalysis. Organocatalysis, you might ask, especially if you're not in the chemistry department. Um, it is, and I quote, finding revolutionary ways to design and build small organic molecules in order to drive chemical reactions. Dave is also a leader in the field of photoredox catalysis, which uses light, ordinary visible light, to break and rejoin atomic bonds one electron at a time. His research has created a more environmentally friendly uh, path to construct new pharmaceutical drugs and chemicals, impacting the production of a wide range of products we use um, every day, hence uh, the citation, making the chemistry uh, greener. 
Um, as David put it to our communications team early this morning, um, what we care about is trying to invent chemistry that has an impact on society and can do some good, and I'm thrilled to have a part in that. Uh, Dave, I, I also hear that you were quite surprised and thought people were prank calling you early in the morning. <laughs> um, so let me now ask uh, Professor Scholes to say a few words and then we'll hear from this year's Nobel laureate. Thank you, Debbie. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> when I called Dave this morning to congratulate him, he wasn't answering his phone because he was simply inundated with messages of congratulations and so on. So <clears throat> I got through to him by calling his wife uh, he answered her phone, and I got to offer my congratulations. Uh, um, so, of course, this is just incredible news, um, both for Dave and for Princeton Chemistry. Ever since Dave arrived at Princeton in 2006, it's been his mission to make Princeton one of the best chemistry departments in the world, and clearly he's leading by example. So, at <clears throat> Princeton Chemistry, we can credit Dave with the renaissance of the department under his leadership as chair of the department. That was from 2010 to 2015. Together with his colleagues, Dave said about hiring faculty who would work creatively, ambitiously, and innovatively. He oversaw the transition to our magnificent new chemistry building, the Frick Lab. He laid down the vision for what the department would look like going forward. He's an absolutely key figure in all of this change. <clears throat> um, as Many of you know, and others will come to know, Dave is a big personality. He's exuberant and a generous colleague. He cares deeply about the success of people around him, particularly the careers of his students and postdocs. I've always admired the way Dave will lock onto something and just see it through with verve and intelligence, um, whether that's a faculty hire, an initiative of some kind, or a great bottle of wine. <laughs> we won't go into those stories. Um, he's incredibly generous, both as a friend and a scientist, and the untold member, um, numbers of people who've benefited from his friendship over the years. Um, chemistry, <clears throat> the central science, also a field that intimidates many people. Um, so hopefully through this prize, you'll get to understand a little bit about what it, you know, why chemistry can be exciting and, and what makes Dave's research so impactful. Um, his research has led to new ways of thinking about making complex molecules the heart of chemistry. It's opened the door to achieving reactions and transformations that we previously couldn't do. For instance, we're able to make certain chemicals, materials, and medicines in ways that are cheap, green, and sustainable. And a huge impact he's made. Perhaps the simplest takeaway is that Dave has lay laid the foundations and opened up a huge new field of chemistry um, through the work that's cited, uh, as well as a whole other part of his research. And for that, we couldn't be prouder of him and the field of chemistry. And great congratulations, Dave. It's fantastic news. Okay, um, I'm sure I was going to mess this up. Okay, um, thank you, Greg, for that. Um, I think most of my group and most of my colleagues who are here know that uh, I'm usually not short on words, um, but I'm having a hard time actually sort of coming up with what to really say right now. But honestly, I'd, I'd start off by thanking the Swedish Academy, thanking the, or, or the Nobel Committee for, for making this selection. Um, I want to thank Princeton University, Debbie, Chris, Sanj, David Dobkin, uh, for just standing by chemistry and standing by my group and investing in us in fantastic ways. And I'm really still blown away by how much this university cares about excellence and about doing good for society. And they really do walk that walk, which has always been impressive to me. So I wanted to thank them. I wanted to thank my wife and my kids, Emma, uh, Lauren, Danielle, who are sitting over there trying to figure out what on earth is going on and uh, how did this really happen? And it's just, you know, they've been just, they're just the best family in the world. So 
nothing to do with the, the prize, but just to do with being a family. They're just the most uh, fantastic people in my life, and I have to sort of thank them. Uh, I have to thank my colleagues, um, Greg, all these uh, bums in the front row, Tom, Paul, um, just these wonderful people who make our department not just a great scientific environment, but just a, a wonderful place to show up every day and enjoy being around each other. And, you know, we, we debate science, we debate soccer, we debate what's a good bottle of wine, we debate everything, but we have a great time doing it. And I just wanted to sort of thank them for all of their sort of support and encouragement. And then, before I say a few more words, then, the one other group I want to thank is, is my group. And my group are the people who really deserve the absolute most credit for me being a representative sitting up on this stage. Um, I worked for an advisor called Dave Evans, and I, I love that man. I love the man. And he was once asked a really difficult question on a stage like this. And he said, and he, he was having a hard time thinking that because the group knew the answer, but he didn't know the answer. So he said, well, you know, if you think about it, he said, I'm just like the Queen of England. He said, I represent the country, but I've got no idea how the country works. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so I have to turn to my group and say, you know, those are the people who are, I'm a representative of them. And it's a lot of the times I don't know how the, the country works. Uh, but those people who have sort of bought into what we do and what we care about and how we go forward in, in our science have been remarkable now and are remarkable now and have been remarkable over the last 20 years, and, and I really can't express my gratitude enough for everything that they've, they've done for us. Um, I'll finish off by saying I work in catalysis. As Debbie said, you'll hear a lot about that. Um, you know, I think it's very difficult sometimes to explain to the outside world what we do and what chemists do. But the one thing I will say is that everything that we do or what chemists does impacts everything that's around us all the time and is immediately in front of us. And it is unbelievably exciting to be involved with a science that what you do on a Tuesday can have an impact on a Friday. And as long as we keep sort of maintaining that focus and that drive to, to having that impact, I think we'll all hopefully be in good shape going forward. All right, with that, I'll stop talking. And uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for listening. As folks uh, formulate their questions in their mind, as reporters have their pads and pens uh, at the ready, uh, Professor Dave, if I may, uh, maybe I can get us started. Um, I, I actually was going to uh, not call you the, the, the queen of catalysis or the queen of England of catalysis. Rather, as you had noted, you debate soccer with your group sometimes, the Sir Alex of catalysis. Uh, I'm, just, I'm gonna try that out and see if it sticks. Uh, understanding you have a team behind you in all of that. Um, uh, uh, but moving away from soccer, um, <laughs> unless you want to stick with soccer. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I believe earlier today you, you were speaking with a reporter about the story of how your parents um, raised you and your, and your brother, and your brother was first in the family to go to, to college. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit about uh, that, that story, and your, your uh, upbringing and the role of your parents and, and how that translates into the advice you give students uh, as they start out in their career. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I grew up in Western Scotland, uh, just outside of Glasgow. It was a working class family. My father was a steel worker. My mom was a home help. And uh, basically I went to the school called Belsall Academy, which is a fantastic learning experience in many, many different types of ways. Um, my brother wanted to go to college, but no one we knew of ever went to college, and we didn't know of anyone who went to college. And so, but my brother was determined, despite everyone trying to convince him otherwise. And then he went off to college, and, and he did that, and he came out, and he got a job. And the first day he got a job, he made more money in his salary than, than my dad as a steel worker made. And my dad told me that day, I was going to, I was going to college. <laughs> and so I had no choice in the matter. Um, so for me, that was, it was important because it, it was that sort of moment of sort of learning that there is this world outside of your own world, and there are sort of these frontiers that you can go off and be part of and enjoy and see the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, I'm internally grateful to my parents, obviously, but also to my brother for, because he was the one who took the leap. I was the one who was just told what to do. 
And so, uh, you know, that was basically the story I was telling them of, of why, you know, it's, you know, we all have these kind of interesting sort of pathways that we move through life. And that was certainly some, an interesting part for me and one to my parents and my, my brother that'll be, my sister's going to kill me for saying all of this, actually. But, um, but yeah, that's, that, that's why it was important. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. All right, let's turn to the floor then and see if we have a question from the media. And uh, Mike Hotchkiss here in the front will help identify you, so please raise your hand if you have a question. And we can also uh, entertain questions from the broader community if, if someone would like to, to raise a question for the professor. As questions are being formulated, maybe I'll try another one. Uh, I won't switch uh, fields of play, but uh, maybe looking ahead a little bit, um, what, what do the next few weeks hold for you? Or is it uh, Thursday is a normal Thursday? Uh, or, or is it back-to-back uh, -back interviews? What do you think uh, lies ahead, or do you know? I have no idea what's about <laughs> to, to uh, a bunch of my friends were contacting me, asking me if I want to go to Vegas with them, but I'll probably... Um... <laughs> Well, maybe I'll sort of pass on that at least for a week. Um, uh, but no, I, I, I think I'm going to uh, try and enjoy the next few days, um, and enjoy it with my group as well. We have a big group event planned for next week. We had a celebration planned for a different reason, so I'm sure that'll be a great celebration next week. And uh, yeah, just um, have a great time sort of catching up with all the, the well-wishers on email and text, et cetera, and, and, and talking to people uh, live. I'm, I guess I'm talking to the BBC at, at four, 45, and I never thought I'd ever be on a call with the BBC. So that's going to be really, really, uh, well, not for good reasons anyway, but the, uh, oh, no. so, so I'm sort of excited to see how that's going to go. Well, we know there's a lot of pride on both sides of the Atlantic, so <laughs> it makes sense. All right. Mike, do we have a question? Excellent. My name is Dean Edelman. Uh, that's a name, not a title. I work in corporate engagement and at Princeton University. Congratulations, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Uh, first, I want to thank you. When I first left private sector to come here, uh, people asked what I loved about this, and I said I love playing a small role in the effort of everybody in supporting people who could one day win a Nobel Prize, and you've made a, an honest man out of me, so thank you very much. Um, the question is, um, uh, we heard Debbie uh, mention uh, Merck, as, and when I talk to people in academia and at, outside, they often view the pursuit of knowledge that leads to a Nobel Prize as one thing and research with industry as another. Um, can you share how you view engagement with industry relates to your research? Sure. I mean, I think... All of the chemists who are here today know the same, very much know this. I mean, there, there's fundamental research, and fundamental research is unbelievably important. But we all understand, too, that there are these industries that impact society that are doing remarkable, remarkable research and doing it at a level that I think just increases and expands every single year, and to the point that they are having, obviously, a, a dramatic impact on society. When you have these two tremendous research communities that exist side by side, it's almost nonsensical for them not to build bridges between the two and, and try and take what we're developing here and get it towards really important applications, whether that's medicine, materials, you name it. It, it's, it. it doesn't make sense not to do that. So Dean, Ian Davies is here, a lot of the other people at Princeton, a lot of people at a lot of different universities do care enormously about how do you get these fundamental findings, these understandings, and get them to the point where it has benefit for society. We have to do that. It would be crazy not to. So I think that's something that's becoming more and more important and more people are, you know, clearly care about doing so. Thank you. We have another question. Yeah, reminded to look upstairs as well in case there's someone who might. We have microphones there as well. I'm Chris Sims, a professor in the econ economics department. Uh, your uh, research has been characterized as, in some sense, green. Um, 
And I don't really understand in what sense it is green. I would be interested to hear you elaborate on that. Yeah. It, you know, that's a, that's a great, I, I'm, I'm going to have to look up green in the dictionary later on. It, not that I don't think our research is green, I just don't know what the accepted definition of green really means at this point. Um, what I would say is that what we were involved with and what we developed and what this prize is about was there was an understanding that you could do catalysis. And catalysis does impact every single component of our life, even though chemists are not great at explaining that to people. But it, it changes everything we do in our lives. And if you think that the catalysts that are out there, and many of them are metals, and they're spectacularly important, but there was clearly a, an opportunity or a way to think about how you could replace some of those metals with organic molecules. And organic molecules, as we all know, are, you know, you think about your hand, your body, it's organic, right? It exists in the atmosphere, it exists, it's benign. It doesn't, you know, when, when you know, human beings, despite our actions, human beings themselves, your, their molecules are not problematic to the planet. So if you can make catalysts from those organic molecules, you clearly can do something that hopefully can allow you to, all those catalysis efforts, some of them known, some of them unknown, to go forward, but also do it in the context of using molecules which are going to be biodegradable and benign to, to the planet. So in that context, I'm pretty sure that's, that's what it means. Um, I think the other part, though, which I think everyone here cares about in th this group over here, is trying to come up with new ways to make molecules undergo reactions with each other, or reactivity, or reactivity principles. And new ways of coming up with doing catalysis is going to be so critical to everything we're trying to do as a planet. It's extraordinarily important, whether it's metals, whether it's not metals, whether it's organic, we have to do that. We've only scratched the surface, and, but we have to do so much more if we're going to have the impact that we need to have. I, I love hearing that, and, and you've just received the Nobel Prize, and you're looking at what the next challenge is and realize that there's important as impact to, to still be had. Uh, Mike, our next question in the back. Hi, I'm uh, Diane Dezebo from AFP. Um, you were saying this morning that you were in disbelief, that you thought it was a prank. Um, now that it's sinking in, first of all, how do you feel? Um, and what impact do you hope that this prize will have? Thank you. How does it feel? Um, I would say, um, I would say um, it's dazed and confused. I would say it's, it's just incredibly excited, um, incredibly um, surreal. Um, I, I, I'm still trying to find the feet, my feet underneath me, to be honest, quite now. But it's, all, it's a whirlwind, but it's a kind of fun whirlwind, I would say. Uh, it's very bizarre. But at the same time, it's given me a moment to, you know, it's one of those weird moments in life where you have to sit about, think about all the people who got you here, and it makes you very sentimental, actually, in an interesting sort of way. Um, and the second part of your question, sorry, I was, um, the impact on me or, or for, for the world? <laughs> Um, I think, you know, the impact is my group is going to have to work even harder to prove, um, <laughs> to prove that they deserve this. I think, you know, I, that's, that's clearly the number one impact. Uh, the second impact, I think this will clearly make the university realize what they've got in the chemistry department, so they're going to clearly have to put more resources behind chemistry. <laughs> um, sorry, Yeah, but I also, I mean, in a tiny, tiny way, every time we can explain chemistry to the outside world, that's a really kind of fun thing to do. And I think it'll, hopefully we can keep communicating. We have fantastic scientific communicators here at, at Princeton. And if we can keep communi communicating to the outside world, we obviously have big problems we have to address as a world. And it's going to have to happen through chemistry. And so as long as we can keep communicating, I, I think that's a good thing. Several of us were taking notes furiously as you were speaking, and for the communication side, uh, we are certainly invoking catalysis in a way we never have before. So we'll be an ally in your communications efforts. Uh, do we have another, uh, another question? I see a hand to the right-hand side here. Hi, Dave. Uh, I'm Wendy Plump. I'm from the Department of Chemistry. This, um, 
Nobel is for previous work that you've done years and years ago. Your group has since pivoted and is going in a new direction. So I wondered if you could talk about the necessity for a scientist to continually create and in different directions. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I did bring a PowerPoint presentation as well, so I'm ready to go. <laughs> the, um, no, thanks, Wendy. I mean, what my group is really excited about is, we just talked about it, the, these new reactivity ideas, like how do you make molecules and reactions do things they've never done before? And how can you get that to impact the world? So we're doing a lot of that, as Debbie mentioned, with light, um, which it turns out there's a lot you can do with light. Greg is one of the experts in understanding this. So we're really working hard to try and figure that out. In terms of where we're going with that, new transformations are going to be important, uh, but we're also moving into an area of trying to use this for chemical biology. And people like Tom Muir, who are sitting in the front row, have been fantastic at sort of coaxing me and pulling me into that world in, in terms of new innovations and ways that you can sort of get insights the way Tom's group has insights in biology. And I really do think that that's also an area where we think the insights can be really profound and, and, and expansive. So we're really excited about moving catalysis into exploring the, the biological world. Thank you, Wendy. Do we have any other questions? Uh, we have back. Hi, Liz Fuller Wright, Office of Communications. Uh, you mentioned that you can have an experiment on a Tuesday and see a result in the real world on a Friday. It sounds like you're thinking of a story. Can we hear it? Sorry. Uh, what was the example of seeing a reaction on a Tuesday and having it affect the world on a Friday? I group deal with us all the time, where we sit in subgroups all the time, and, and these are some of the best scientists in the world. They're, you know, 21, 22 years old, and they're literally doing experiments on a Tuesday. They discover something... We have discussions with major pharmaceutical companies all the time, and they learn about what we're doing, and they're literally employing it on a Friday. And when you come back, sometimes I tell my group this, and they don't believe me. And then they actually get to see these companies widely employing these transformations that are happening here at Princeton and being adopted so rapidly. And there's two parts to that which I think are really wonderful. The first part is people who are just starting off on their PhD, seeing that the impact of what they are doing can really immediately be translated into a, a medicine or a medical purpose. And I think the second part is just the rate of adoption. And the, the rate at which it's happening now is fantastic. It's so fast. But at the same time, it makes it really, really important that what we're doing can be translatable, that will, have an, will be used by people in those, those settings. So the Tuesday to Friday thing is actually completely right. It's also it's incredibly uh, exciting when you see a company making a drug using technologies that was developed in a little fume hood at the back end of a lab in Princeton. It's really, it's pretty neat. Thank you, Liz. We have a question in the back. Hi, um, I'm Angus Dayton, um, Angus. Economics. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about Bell Cell Academy and um, Glasgow University. Um, the, the Scottish education system in my cohort, which is a generation older than yours, had a, a bunch of very distinguished people, many of whom became Nobel laureates, many of whom now work in the United States. And I'd sort of wondered if the education system had faltered over the last, over the 20 years since then. But it sounds like your experience, you, like me, had a fabulous local high school that did wonders for you. No, 100%. And, um, I, you know, I, you know, I grew up in a really working class neighborhood and went to a working class primary school and uh, had a spectacular education from people who, you know, the teachers were just spectacularly committed. And they didn't have to be, they just were. They were just, they were really cared enormously. And I think Scotland, Scotland's proud of a lot of different things, and uh, as we should be, and, uh, but we're very proud of our education. And uh, I think in high school as well, we have a, a brilliant high school education too. And then in Glasgow Uni, I think Glasgow University is, is you know, for, at least from my perspective, as someone who went there petrified about going to college, uh, the way that the people really work hard to sort of bring people through in those 
uh, departments and get them excited about the science. Again, was sort of part and parcel of why so many people, I think, go on and keep moving forward in those sciences. So yeah, it's a tiny little country, as you and I know, but it does really well in a, a number of different things. And I think education is, is absolutely one of them. One of the things that we're very proud about, we can't be proud about our soccer team very often, so we have to be proud of other things. So, so education's good. Thank you, Serengas Dean, a fellow Nobel laureate. Thank you for being here. Do we have another question? Hi, I'm Adam Sanders. I'm an undergraduate. Um, for those of us who are not super familiar with the products of your research, um, do you have any examples of like uh, com commercial applications or applications in our day-to-day -day life that we might know of as being impacted by research into catalysis? Yeah. Um, so. Organocatalysis is, well, the photoredox part is being used in making drugs every single day. There's too many of them to, to discuss. The organocatalysis in terms of scale up of producing uh, drugs, drugs on an enormous scale suitable to be enough material for society. Merck, Novartis, I think Pfizer have all used organocatalysis to do that numerous times. I'll give you one other example is that there's a a uh, flavor and fragrance company in Geneva, in Switzerland, called Firminich, and they use organocatalysis, and they are using it to make this molecule, which is called the Bloom constituent. And the Bloom constituent is, as mundane as this sounds, is when you, you take a shower in the morning, you put your shampoo on, and you get this bursty smell. And that bursty smell is actually, it's an artificial thing, it's, a, it's called the Bloom constituent. And it's made through organocatalysis. And the head of research there one day I was visiting in Switzerland said, you know, we sell this Bloom constituent to all of North America. He said, you know, your graduate students will all be using this on a daily basis within six months. And I said, you don't know my graduate students. So. Uh, Graduate students, uh, a response. Uh, the microphones are around the floor. Um, <laughs> up top. Aggressive chemist and not stand on the, you know, stand on the toes too much of the one's advisor. Well, what advice would you give to the younger PhD students? Transgressive chemist, someone that kind of pushes chemist. the boundaries and pushes and tries. <laughs> oh, I'm not quite sure what that means, but uh, so. Well, you know, someone, like, you know, someone that does research, uh, ground-based ground -based research without following, you know, the protocols of my, my personal, honest to goodness opinion is that every single person at Princeton University Chemistry Department does groundbreaking research. I am, you, and you'd be hard pressed to convince me otherwise. I would say that if you talk to those people and you talk to them about what gets them excited, you will learn it. I'm, I'm a big fan of the idea, a lot of people don't believe this, but I'm a big fan that you can learn to be creative. Um, creativity is not just this thing that you're born with and we tend to sort of think that and I don't believe that at all. I think you can learn to be creative. And I think if you talk to these people in our department, you talk to them about the problems that they're working on. They're all working on extraordinarily significant problems. And even more than that, a lot of the times they came up with the, the questions as much as the answers. And I think when you're surrounded by people who are like that, you will learn to do the same thing. It's a learnable skill set, to be honest. So I would argue spend time with them, watch what they do, and start to formulate your own questions. It's not about the answers necessarily, it's often about the questions. And, uh, sorry, could you hear me? Yeah, my name is Huang. I'm from Electrical Engineering, and uh, I'm actually very inspired by the Tuesday to uh, Friday story that you just shared. Um, however, I'm also aware that in recent progresses in other research, uh, some progress has been pretty arduous, time-consuming, labor-consuming, and it might be like a process development that lasts for a few years in a particular field. So I wonder if you could share a, a story about such any difficulty that you have seen in your career, and especially like how you uh, mitigate it or overcome though, and how that might help link to faster progress like your Tuesday to Friday story. 
Yeah, that's a great question. I wish I knew all the answers to that one. Um, it is true that once, you know, there, unfortunately, there's a lot of fashion that happens in science, which is a shame if you think about it. Science should be an absolute uh, component that we should all care about and be able to evaluate and move forward with. But a lot of times there is fashion in, associated with it. What we really need is to be able to demonstrate and allow the community to understand how to adopt and move on with the sort of key discoveries faster. And that's a really, really difficult thing to do because there's so much going on, right? So the question is, how do you, how do you allow adoption to happen faster? My personal story was we did this work using light and for probably four years, uh, I don't think really anyone took it seriously because how do you light any a chemical reaction? How do you start to use light? No chemists really, and at least in organic chemistry, really use light very much outside of high energy UV. So it took a lot of time to sort of build up enough, um, I would say, convincing the community that it was real, that once it started to, that started to happen, it was kind of like an avalanche and it just takes its own life and off it goes. So I do, I do, do agree with you, there's many times when it's difficult to get the avalanche going, but it's worth pursuing it if you know that at the end of the day, there's gonna be a lot of value there. And there's a lot of things, again, that these people in the, in the front row are doing, which is extraordinarily valuable, but you're right, it does take time often to get the community behind it, but once they get behind it, it's worthwhile. And so you have to really spend time making sure that happens. It really is important. Hello? Okay. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Adam Reinhelm. I'm actually a member of Greg's lab. Um, and the first thing that, so earlier in the day, we had the celebration for you, and uh, you brought up, or they brought up that uh, what really won this Nobel Prize was a two-page Jax paper. <laughs> and what that immediately reminded me of was um, the, the modern laser is based off a of one-page report, too. So I guess my question is, how do you remain headstrong when uh, it's not like, a 10-page science or nature paper that uh, uh, got you the Nobel Prize. It's something that might be overlooked by someone or, in the field or so. How do you, how do you remain headstrong and, and confident in your science in that? Yeah, it's, um, that's a great, another great question. It's not easy. Um, the, and the other part is, we were talking about this this morning as well, there was so, it used to be there was no, not enough scientific communication out there. It feels like today there's so much scientific communication when you think about everyone putting so much of their work out on Twitter as well as other social media platforms to be able to determine what is really the, where is the, 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 the stronger parts, where is the parts that we should be gravitating towards. I do though believe, I mean, that paper, it was a thing called the deals all the reaction and just to be really boring to all of the other people who are not chemists here, a deals all the reaction, Eric will tell me, I think it was 1940s that deals all was developed, it was 1940s, 1948. And so, I mean, we, this, this paper that you're referring to, which literally helped get this field going, uh, cost probably to run, the reaction must have cost about maybe somewhere between five cents and 10 cents to perform that experiment on a reaction that was invented in 1948. So it doesn't take a lot in terms of necessarily holding the, uh, the strengths to go forward on the nature of what you have to, the infrastructure, the equipment, all those things, although maybe in Greg's world it does, but I think it's the concepts, it's the ideas, and as long as the ideas are different and are going to lead to things which are beyond it, beyond what, I mean, it's way beyond what happened on that two-page paper, but the concept that was in that paper set the, it was the setting for all these other reactions that you could do thereafter, and that's the key part. So anyone that tells you it's expensive to get new research going, and I'm going to take this back in a second with Debbie. Anyone who, anyone, anyone who tells you that it's expensive to get new research going, it's not true, but it's the follow through that's expensive. But the new concepts are, are not expensive. Thank you for the question. There's another one in the back. All right, Dave, you have to answer this question very carefully. Where is the next trip, group trip going to be? 
So this is one of my graduate students, who, they're always trying to get freebies out of me. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and Beryl is the best in the world at actually doing this, and that's why she was elected to ask this question. Um, the next trip, I, I feel, is, is going to be a really important trip. I think, you know, we really have to you know, start to think about maybe having group meetings twice a week. Um, <laughs> And so I'm thinking, I'm trying to envision where another really nice setting, but you, there's always nice places in the world where we could go for a nice group meeting. So I think we'll think about that and come up with an answer later on when the provost is not here. All right. <laughs> uh, my name is Sujay. I'm an undergraduate in electrical engineering. And you talked a lot earlier about your high school experience which, um, and your college experience, which contributed to where you are today. How do you think we can improve the scientific education at a younger age for students and encourage them to pursue paths in chemistry and other sciences like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. I, I mean, I'm not just saying this because I'm on this stage. I mean, Princeton is pretty remarkable, right? I mean, it, what it does for young people and undergraduates especially, it really goes the extra mile to bring everyone through. And I mean, everyone through, scientific, and science and otherwise, which is really remarkable. And, you know, I would not say that if I didn't, <laughs> if I didn't believe it, trust me. Um, so I think Princeton is, is pretty, I would say that the, the rest of the U.S. is not as quite, up to, I don't think, at the same level as Princeton. And I really do think if you want to bring younger people through to really get involved with science more, you have to expose them to it. You have to get them in labs. You have to get them thinking about what it's like to actually do science, and if you can sort of do it, you can sort of think about it, and you can connect all those dots. So I do think getting more people exposed to it, obviously, is the smart way of doing it. Um, but yeah, I, I do think Princeton is remarkably good at doing it for undergraduates, actually. They're really good. Um, <clears throat> hi, my name is Meryl. I'm an undergraduate in chemical engineering. So my question is, um, what specifically like piqued your interest in exploring this novel field in the first place? And what are some of the biggest challenges you face maybe in the methodology of your research that might not be apparent to someone from the outside? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the, the hardest part is um, new reactivity. This thing I keep saying is really, really difficult. Um, if you actually look at the new reactivity principles, at least in catalysis, in the last 30 years, uh, I think there's like maybe 10 of them, and I think almost all the people who did that got Nobel Prizes. And so it's, if you can do it, it's extraordinarily important, but it's really, really hard to sort of get there. So, but again, I really believe we're just scratched the surface on being able to think about those new reactivity ideas. How do you get catalysts to do things that to with molecules that they've never done before. And it's, it's, it's absolutely available. And when you do it, it will, it, will, it will have a big impact. So I think in a methodology sense, if I was giving someone an advice about going into catalysis, I would say don't focus on exploiting what's known. I would say focus on trying to invent a completely unknown way of, of trying to get molecules to react with each other. Hi, I'm Fred Houston. I'm in molecular biology. Um, it, this seems like the right quick time to ask um, for your take on the brief history of organic catalysis. Like, where did this idea, briefly, where did this idea come from? And so I'm and laughing. This, story? So this is Fred who's asking me a serious question. So um, the only time I hang out with Fred all the time, usually drinking wine and playing poker. So it's really difficult to actually sort of be able to take this question seriously. Um, where did it come from, uh, the organocatalysis part? It was basically, uh, when, I was a, when I was a postdoc at Harvard, um, every day I would roll in and I'd go to a glove box and I'd have to put my hands in a glove box for eight hours a day trying to get these metals to go into these vials and they would, so that they could react and, and do some chemistry. And this sort of blew me away that, you know, we're spending all this time and energy stuck behind these artificial circumstances to do catalysis. You know, nature does catalysis all the time. It doesn't use a glove box. So my, when I went off to Berkeley, one of my sort of big dreams was how do we come up with ways of doing catalysis that involve small molecules that everyone has in their stock rooms and you could actually get them, instead of being molecules as reagents or as substrates, how do we make them any catalysts? 
And so as soon as we, we did that, and as soon as it started working, then we started getting pretty excited about could this be expandable? And then it, that's when it took off like gangbusters. It really went, it really went crazy. Thanks, Fred. <laughs> How are Fred's poker skills? Fred is a very, very good poker player. I think he always, I think he always comes in second, which means that, <laughs> no, that's a good thing because you get to take your money home. I say. Hi, Dave. It's Spencer Reynolds from uh, uh, Corporate Engagement and Foundation Relations. So, in addition to bringing molecules together uh, on campus, you've also done a lot of work bringing people together. I'm thinking here of the uh, Princeton Catalysis Initiative. Could you talk a little bit about what inspired that originally and uh, what you think it's done for science on campus here? Yeah, no, the Princeton Catalysis Initiative has been fantastic. I mean, it really has been. Um, this was an initiative that was born out of myself, Tom Muir, Marty Semelhek, uh, basically chatting about ways to get scientists to talk to each other uh, more often. And not just scientists who live on the same corridor or in the same department, but live all over the campus. And so we took an idea with uh, Paul, Abby, and Rob, and we took an idea over to Debbie. Debbie and Chris uh, were incredibly receptive to funding this and getting behind this idea of how do you get people all over the campus to start working with each other. So we came up with the idea of speed dating for scientists. And speed dating for scientists is a symposium where scientists from all over the department come in and they give a five minute talk on what they're doing to all the other scientists from all over the campus. And then at the end of the day, they can send in a one slide PowerPoint on hopefully a project that connects two completely different departments who would never envision that they would work with each other or could not even envision the, that would be possible. But after the speed dating event, they would know that they could do this. And, and at the end of the first uh, symposium, I think we had 64 different applications, which was fantastic. Industry and pharma and all these other big things, they got really excited about it. And we started off thinking that we would like to be able to fund maybe 50 collaborations. And I think now with the, all the different people that get involved, I think we're now up to, we can fund 700 different collaborations on campus. And we don't think this has been done anywhere else in the US or in the world. And we do, we are beginning to see all these new types of research coming out of it that previously people had not sort of conceived of. So from our point of view, it was just an idea of how do you get all these scientists to just have these more collisions with each other so they could start, in informal ways, start talking to each other and start to do new things. And so far, it's been really wonderful. And again, I really have to thank the administration for getting behind it. That, that's great to hear. Certainly, one of the things uh, I first heard uh, that distinguishes Princeton is the interdisciplinary nature of the research and the studies among students. Uh, what a great proof point, uh, as well as the investment the university makes in such things. Mike, do we have another? Oh, great. Hi, I'm Rebecca in the Bacarsley Lab. Um, just very broadly, what drew you to pursue a career in chemistry? What led me to pursue a career in chemistry? Um, I, <laughs> I'll tell, I'm not going to tell you that. Well, anyway. Um, um, so basically, I, I went to college to be a physicist because my brother was a physicist. And I, I'm going to regret this. My wife's telling me right now, don't say it, don't say it. But I went and in the college, it was an eight o'clock in the morning class in this, this lecture theater, and it was freezing. And it used to, it was in Scotland, so it used to rain, and, the, and it would literally rain on you in the lecture theater. Meanwhile, the, the chemistry lecture theater was at 10 a.m., and it was warm and heated. Um, <laughs> so in my second year at college, I had to make an executive decision, and uh, suddenly organic chemistry spoke to me. Uh, <laughs> My wife's going to absolutely kill me for telling me. That's actually a true story. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's a profound note to... Uh, <laughs> we, do, we do have a minute or two for another question, if there is one. Hi, I'm John Minkilo from the Associated Press. We're living in a very precarious time where science is in question. As a scientist who has pursued a field that has changed the lives of everyone in this room and around the world, what message do you send to the wider world about the importance of science and what that means for our future? Yeah, that's a phenomenally deep question, obviously. I mean, without science, we don't have anything, right? 
I mean, we don't have society, we don't have ways of being, we don't have ways of interacting, we have nothing. So we need science. Once you get to that basic level of understanding, I think it's getting back to the whole, you know, trust in facts, trust in the truth. Um, I think we just have to rebuild this idea that we trust these institutions that we grew up trusting, right? Why would we stop to sort of throw them away? So at least from, from my sort of view on that is it's getting back to communication and trust. If we get back to communication, we get back to the trust, get back to understanding that science is, you know, we're, we're sort of doomed without it, right? So it's sort of critical that we, we have to care about science. Otherwise, it's, it, yeah, it's not going to go anywhere. That was the profound note that might uh, bring us to an end. Uh, if there are no further questions, thank you so much, Professor McMillan. Congratulations again to everyone in the audience. Thank you for your questions uh, and for uh, the combined uh, uh, celebration. Um, that celebration will continue just outside in the tent, a short walk away, when we will toast our newest Nobel laureate and our others in our community. Thank you again, and congratulations. Congratulations.